Hello, and welcome to Short Stories, a production of Adventures in Audio.net. I'm Robert Crandall, and I just want to make an announcement. Reports that listening to this podcast causes bleeding of the epidermis throughout the body have not been confirmed. So relax, you'll be fine. And I certainly hope that your life is a magnificent experience of enchantment and delight. You know, I made some changes to the website, and more are on the way. I kind of ran ran into a snag this week and didn't do much. But uh, I'm working on some things, and I'm working on a couple of major enhancements to the listening experience. I was hoping to make an announcement on this episode, but things are not complete just yet. So check, uh, check back on the website often, and by the next episode, I should have some more information, I hope anyway. So about this story. This uh, story is by Herbert George Wells, or best known as H.G. Wells. Wells is known for his science fiction and other genres. And this story is a little departure from that. In this story is romance, infidelity, and a gruesome murder. And now, The Cone by H.G. Wells. The night was hot and overcast, the sky red, rimmed with the lingering sunset of midsummer. They sat at the open window, trying to fancy the air was fresher there. The trees and shrubs of the garden stood stiff and dark. Beyond in the roadway, a gas lamp burnt, bright orange against the hazy blue of the evening. Farther were the three lights of the railway signal against the lowering sky. The man and woman spoke to one another in low tones. He does not suspect, said the man a little nervously. Not he, she said peevishly as though that too irritated her. He thinks nothing but the works and the prices of fuel. He has no imagination, no poetry. None of these men of iron have, he said sententiously. They have no hearts. He has not, she said. She turned her discontented face towards the window. The distant sound of a roaring and rushing drew nearer and grew in volume. The house quivered. One heard the metallic rattle of the tender. As the train passed, there was a glare of light above the cutting and a driving tumult of smoke. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight black oblongs, eight trucks passed across the dim gray of the embankment and were suddenly extinguished one by one in the throat of the tunnel, which with the last seemed to swallow down train, smoke, and sound in one abrupt gulp. This country was all fresh and beautiful once, he said, and now it is Gehenna, down that way, nothing but pot banks and chimneys belching fire and dust into the face of heaven. But what does it matter? And in comes an end to all this cruelty. Tomorrow. He spoke the last word in a whisper. Tomorrow, she said, speaking in a whisper too, and still staring out of the window. Dear, he said, putting his hand on hers. She turned with a start, and their eyes searched one another's. Hers softened to his gaze. My dear one, she said, and then, It seems so strange that you should have come into my life like this, to open. She paused. To open, he said. 
all this wonderful world. She hesitated and spoke still more softly. This world of love to me. Then suddenly the door clicked and closed. They turned their heads, and he started violently back. In the shadow of the room stood a great shadowy figure, silent. They saw the face dimly in the half-light, with the unexpressive dark patches under the penthouse brows. Every muscle in Rout's body suddenly became tense. When could the door have opened? What had he heard? Had he heard all? What had he seen? A tumult of questions. The newcomer's voice came at last, after a pause that seemed interminable. Well, he said, I was afraid I had missed you, Horrocks, said the man at the window, gripping the window ledge with his hand. His voice was unsteady. The clumsy figure of Horrocks came forward out of the shadow. He made no answer to Rot's remark. For a moment he stood above them. The woman's heart was cold within her. I told Mr. Rot it was just possible you might come back, she said in a voice that never quivered. Horrocks, still silent, sat down abruptly in the chair by her little work table. His big hands were clenched. One saw now the fire of his eyes under the shadow of his brows. He was trying to get his breath. His eyes went from the woman he had trusted to the friend he had trusted and then back to the woman. By this time and for the moment, all three half understood one another. Yet none dared say a word to ease the pent-up feelings that choked them. It was the husband's voice that broke the silence at last. You wanted to see me, he said to Rout. Rout started as he spoke. I came to see you, he said, resolved to lie to the last. Yes, said Horrocks. You promised, said Rout to show me some fine effects of moonlight and smoke. I promise to show you some fine effects of moonlight and smoke, repeated Horrocks in a colorless voice, and I thought I might catch you tonight before you went down to the works, proceeded Round, and come with you. There was another pause. Did the man mean to take the thing coolly? Did he, after all, know? How long had he been in the room? Yet even at the moment when they heard the door, their attitudes. Horrocks glanced at the profile of the woman, shadowy, pallid in the half-light. Then he glanced at Rout, and seemed to recover himself suddenly. Of course, he said. I promise to show you the works under their proper dramatic conditions. It's odd how I could have forgotten. If I am troubling you, began Rout. Horrocks started again. A new light had suddenly come into the sultry gloom of his eyes. Not in the least, he said. Have you been telling Mr. Rout of all these contrasts of flame and shadow you think so splendid? Said the woman, turning now to her husband for the first time, her confidence creeping back again, her voice just one half note too high. That dreadful theory of yours that machinery is beautiful and everything else in the world ugly? I thought he would not spare you, Mr. Rout. It's his great theory, his one discovery in art. I am slow to make discoveries, said Horrocks, grimly damping her suddenly. But I discover... He stopped. Well, she said, nothing. And suddenly he rose to his feet. 
I promise to show you the works, he said to Ralph, and put his big clumsy hand on his friend's shoulder. Are you ready to go? Quite, said Rout, and stood up also. There was another pause. Each of them peered through the indistinctness of the dusk at the other two. Horrick's hand still rested on Rout's shoulder. Rout half fancied still that the incident was trivial after all. But Mrs. Horrocks knew her husband better knew that grim quiet in his voice, and the confusion in her mind took a vague shape of physical evil. Very well, said Horrocks, and dropping his hand, turned towards the door. My hat, Rout looked around in the half-light. That's my work basket, said Mrs. Horrocks with a gust of hysterical laughter. Their hands came together on the back of the chair. Here it is, he said. She had an impulse to mourn him in an undertone, but she could not frame a word. Don't go. And beware of him, struggled in her mind, and the swift moment passed. Got it, said Horrock, standing with the door half open. Rout stepped towards him. Better say goodbye to Mrs. Horrocks, said the Iron Master, even more grimly quiet in his tone than before. Rout started and turned. A good evening, Mrs. Horrocks, he said, and their hands touched. Horrocks held the door open with a ceremonial politeness unusual in him towards men. Rout went out, and then after a wordless look at her, her husband followed. She stood motionless while Rout's light footfall and her husband's heavy tread, like bass and treble, passed down the passage together. The front door slammed heavily. She went to the window, moving slowly, and stood watching, leaning forward. The two men appeared for a moment at the gateway in the road, passed under the street lamp, and were hidden by the black masses of the shrubbery. The lamplight fell for a moment on their faces, showing only unmeaning pale patches, telling nothing of what she still feared and doubted, and craved vainly to know. Then she sank down into a crouching attitude in the big armchair, her eyes wide open and staring out at the red lights from the furnaces that flickered in the sky. An hour after she was still there, her attitude scarcely changed. The oppressive stillness of the evening weighed heavily on Rout. They went side by side, down the road in silence, and in silence turned into the cinder-made byway that presently opened out the prospect of the valley. A blue haze, half dust, half mist, touched the long valley with mystery. Beyond were Hanley and Etruria, gray and dark masses, outlined thinly by the rare golden dots of the street lamps, and here and there a gaslight window, or the yellow glare of some late working factory or crowded public house, out of the masses clear and slender against the evening sky, rose a multitude of tall chimneys, many of them reeking a few smokeless during a season of play. Here and there a pallid patch and ghostly stunted beehive shapes showed the position of a pot bank or a wheel, black and sharp against the hot lower sky, marked some colliery where they raised the iridescent coal of the place. Nearer at hand was the broad stretch of railway, and half-invisible trains shunted, a steady 
puffing and rumbling with every run, a ringing concussion in a rhythmic series of impacts and a passage of intermittent puffs of white steam across the further view. And to the left, between the railway and the dark masses of the low hill beyond, dominating the whole view, colossal, inky black, and crowned with smoke and fitful flames, stood the great cylinders of the Jetta Company blast furnaces, the central edifices of the big ironworks of which Horrocks was the manager. They stood heavy and threatening, full of incessant turmoil of flames and seething molten iron, and about the feet of them rattled the rolling mills, and the steam hammer beat heavily and splashed the white iron sparks hither and thither. Even as they looked, a truck full of fuel was shot into one of the giants, and the red flames gleamed out, and a confusion of smoke and black dust came boiling upwards towards the sky. Certainly you've got some fine effects of color with your furnaces, said Rout breaking a silence that had become apprehensive. Horrocks grunted. He stood with his hands in his pockets, frowning down at the dim, steaming railway and the busy ironworks beyond, frowning as if he were thinking out some naughty problem. Rout glanced at him and away again. At present, your moonlight effect is hardly right. He continued looking upward. The moon is still smothered by the vestiges of daylight. Horrocks stared at him with an expression of a man who had suddenly awakened. Vestiges of daylight. Of course, of course. He looked up at the moon, pale, still, in the midsummer sky. Come along, he said suddenly, and gripping Rout's arm in his hand, made a move towards the path that dropped them to the railway. Rout hung back. Their eyes met and saw a thousand things in a moment that their eyes came near to say. Horrocks' hand tightened and then relaxed. He let go, and before Rout was aware of it, they were arm in arm and walking, one unwillingly enough, down the path. You see the fine effects of the railway signals toward Burslem, said Horrocks, suddenly breaking into loquacity, striding fast and tightening the grip of his elbow the while. Little green lights and red and white lights all against the haze. You have an eye for effect, Rout. It's a fine effect. And look at those furnaces of mine how they rise upon us as we come down the hill. That to the right is my pet, seventy feet of him. I packed him myself, and he's boiled away cheerfully with iron in his guts for five long years. I have a particular fancy for him. That red line there, a lovely bit of warm orange, you'd call it, Rout. That's the puddler's furnaces. And there in the hot light, three black figures. Did you see the white splash of the steam hammer then? That's the rolling mills. Come along. Clang, clatter. How it goes rattling across the floor. Sheet tin, Rout. Amazing stuff. Glass mirrors are not in it when it comes from the mill and squelch. There goes the hammer again. Come along. He had to stop talking to catch at his breath. His arm twisted into routes with a benumbing tightness. He had come striding down the black path towards the railway as though he was possessed. Rout had not spoken a word, had simply hung back against Horrocks' pull with all his strength. I say, he said now, laughing nervously, but with an undernote of snarl in his voice. 
Why on earth are you nipping my arm off, Horrocks, and dragging me along like this? At length, Horrocks released him. His manner changed again. Nipping your arm off, he said. Sorry, but it's you taught me the trick of walking in that friendly way. You haven't learned the refinements of it yet, then, said Rout, laughing artificially. By Jove, I'm black and blue, Horrocks offered no apology. They stood now near the bottom of the hill, close to the fence that bordered the railway. The ironworks had grown larger and spread out with their approach. They looked up to the blast furnaces now instead of down. The further view of Etruria and Hanley had dropped out of sight with their descent. Before them, by the stile, rose a notice board, bearing still dimly visible the words, Beware of the trains, half hidden by splashes of coal and mud. Fine effects, said Horrocks, waving his arm. Here comes a train, the puffs of smoke, the orange glare, the round eye of light in front of it, the melodious rattle. Fine effects, but these furnaces of mine used to be finer. Before we shoved cones in their throats and saved the gas. How? said Rout. Cones? Cones, my man, cones. I'll show you one nearer. The flames used to flare out of the open throats. Great. What was it? Pillars of cloud by day, red and black smoke and pillars of fire by night. Now we run it off in pipes and burn it to heat the blast, and the top is shut by a cone. You'll be interested in that cone. But every now and then, said Rout, you get a burst of fire and smoke up there. The cone's not fixed. It's hung by a chain from a lever and balanced by an equipoise. You shall see it nearer. Else, of course, there'd be no way of getting fuel into the thing. Every now and then the cone dips, and out comes the flare. I see, said Rout. He looked over his shoulder. The moon gets brighter, he said. Come along, said Horrocks, abruptly gripping his shoulder again and moving him suddenly towards the railway crossing. And then came one of those swift incidents, vivid but so rapid, that they leave one doubtful and reeling. Halfway across, Horrocks' hand suddenly clenched upon him like a vice and swung him backward and threw a half turn so that he looked up the line, and there a chain of lamp-lit carriage windows, telescoped swiftly as it came towards them, and the red and yellow lights of an engine grew larger and larger, rushing down upon them. As he grasped what this meant, he turned his face to Horrocks and pushed with all his strength against the arm that held him back between the rails. The struggle did not last a moment, just as certain as it was that Horrocks held him there, so certain was it that he had been violently lugged out of danger. Out of the way, said Horrocks with a gasp as the train came rattling by and they stood panting by the gate into the ironworks. I did not see it coming, said Rout. Still, even in spite of his own apprehensions, trying to keep up an appearance of ordinary intercourse. Horrocks answered with a grunt. The cone, he said, and then, as one who recovers himself, I thought you did not hear. I didn't, said Rout. I wouldn't have had you run over then for the world, said Horrocks. For a moment, I lost my nerve, said Rout. Horrocks stood for half a minute, then turned abruptly towards the ironworks again. See how fine these great mounds of mine. These clinker heaps, look in the night. The truck yonder, up above there. Up it goes, and out tilts the slag. See the palpitating red stuff go sliding down the slope. As we get nearer, the heap rises and 
cuts the blast furnaces. See the quiver up above the big one. Not that way. This way, between the heaps. That goes to the puddling furnaces. But I want to show you the canal first. He came and took Route by the elbow, and so they went along side by side. Rout answered Horrocks vaguely. What, he asked himself, had really happened on the line? Was he deluding himself with his own fancies? Or had Horrocks actually held him back in the way of the train? He had just been within an ace of being murdered. Suppose this slouching, scowling monster did know anything? For a minute or two, then, Rout was really afraid for his life, but the mood passed as he reasoned with himself. After all, Horrocks might have heard nothing. At any rate, he had pulled him out of the way in time. His odd manner might be due to the mere vague jealousy he had shown once before. He was talking now of the ash heaps and the canal. Eh, said Horrocks. What? said Rout. Rather, the haze in the moonlight. Fine. Our canal, said Horrocks, stopping suddenly. Our canal by the moonlight and firelight is an immense effect. You'll never see it again. Fancy that. You've spent too many of your evenings philandering up in Newcastle there. I tell you, for real florid effects. But you shall see boiling water, as they came out of the labyrinth of clinker heaps and mounds of coal and ore. The noises of the rolling mill sprang up upon them suddenly, loud, near, and distinct. Three shadowy workmen went by and touched their caps to hearts. Their faces were vague in the darkness. Rout felt a futile impulse to address them, and before he could frame his words, they passed into the shadows. Horrocks pointed to the canal close before them now. A weird-looking place, it seemed, in the blood-red reflections of the furnaces. The hot water that cooled the two areas came into it. Some fifty yards up, a tumultuous, almost boiling affluent, and the stream rose up from the water in the silent white wisp and streets, wrapping damply about them, an incessant succession of ghosts coming up from the black and red eddies, a white uprising that made the head swim. The shining black tower of the larger blast furnace rose overhead out of the mist, and in its tumultuous riot filled their ears. Rout kept away from the edge of the water and watched Oryx. Here it is red! said Horrocks. Blood red vapor and red and hot as sin. But yonder there, where the moonlight falls on it, and it drives across the clinker heaps, it is as white as death. Rout turned his head for a moment, then came back hastily to watch on Horrocks. Come along to the rolling mills, said Horrocks. The threatening hold was not so evident, that time, and Rout felt a little reassured. But all the same, what on earth did Horrocks mean about white as death and red as sin? Coincidence, perhaps? They went and stood behind the puddlers for a little while, and then through the rolling mills were amidst an incessant din the deliberate steam hammer beat the juice out of the succulent iron, and black, half-naked titans rushed the plastic bars like hot sealing wax between the wheels. Come on, said Horrocks in Rout's ear, and they went and peeped through the little glass hole behind the tureries and saw the tumbled fire writhing in the pit of the blast furnace. It left one eye blinded for a while. Then, with green and blue patches dancing across the dark, they went to the lift by which the trucks of ore and fuel and lime were raised to the top of the big cylinder. 
and out upon the narrow rail that overhung the furnace, Rout's doubts came upon him again. Was it wise to be here, if Horrocks did know everything? Do what he would, he could not resist a violent trembling. Right underfoot was a sheer depth of seventy feet. It was a dangerous place. They pushed by a truck of fuel to get to the railing that crowned the place. The reek of the furnace, a sulfurous vapor streaked with pungent bitterness, seemed to make the distant hillside of Hanley quiver. The moon was riding out now from among a drift of clouds, halfway up the sky above the undulating wooded outlines of Newcastle. The streaming canal ran away from below them under an indistinct bridge and vanished into the dim haze of the flat fields toward Bursalem. That's the cone I've been telling you of, shouted Horrocks. And below that, sixty feet of fire and molten metal, with the air of the blast frothing through it like gas and soda water. Rout gripped the handrail tightly and stared down at the cone. The heat was intense. The boiling of the iron and the tumult of the blast made a thunderous accompany to Horrocks' voice. But the thing had to be gone through now. Perhaps, after all, in the middle, bowled Horrocks. Temperature near a thousand degrees. If you were dropped into it, flash into flame like a pinch of gunpowder and a candle. Put your hand out and feel the heat of its breath. Why, even up here, I've seen the rainwater boiling off the trucks, and that comb there, it's a damn sight too hot for roasting cakes. The top side of it is three hundred degrees. Three hundred degrees? said Rout. Three hundred centigrade, mind, said Horrocks. It will boil the blood out of you in no time. Eh? said Rout, and turned. Boil the blood out of you in... No, you don't. Let me go, screamed Rout. Let go of my arm. With one hand, he clutched the handrail, then with both. For a moment, the two men stood swaying. Then suddenly, with a violent jerk, Horrocks had twisted him from his hold. He clutched at Horrocks and missed. His foot went back into empty air. In midair, he twisted himself and then cheek and shoulder and knee struck the hot cone together. He clutched the chain by which the cone hung, and the thing sank an infinitesimal amount as he struck it. A circle of glowing red appeared about him, and a tongue of flame released from the chaos within flickered up towards him. An intense pain assailed him at the knees, and he could smell the singeing of his hands. He raised himself to his feet and tried to climb up the chain and then something struck his head, black and shining with the moonlight. The throat of the furnace rose about him. Horrocks, he saw, stood above him by one of the trucks of fuel on the rail. The gesticulating figure was bright and white in the moonlight, and shouting, Fizzle, you fool! Fizzle, you hunter of women! You hot-blooded hound, boil, boil, boil. Suddenly he caught up a handful of coal out of the truck and flung it deliberately, lump after lump, at Rout. Horrocks, cried Rout. Horrocks. He clung, crying to the chain, pulling himself up from the burning of the cone, each missile Horrocks flung hit him. His clothes charred and glowed as he struggled the cone dropped and a rush of hot, suffocating gas whooped out 
and burned around him in a swift breath of flame. His human likeness departed from him. When the momentary red had passed, Horrocks saw a charred, blackened figure, its head streaked with blood, still clutching and fumbling with the chain, and writhing in agony, a cindery animal an inhuman, monstrous creature that began a sobbing, intermittent shriek. Abruptly, at the sight, the Iron Master's anger passed. A deadly sickness came upon him. The heavy odor of burning flesh came drifting up to his nostrils. His sanity returned to him. God have mercy upon me, he cried. Oh, God, what have I done? He knew the thing below him, save that it still moved and felt, was already a dead man, that the blood of the poor wretch must be boiling in his veins. An intense realization of that agony came to his mind and overcame every other feeling. For a moment he stood irresolute, and then turning to the truck, he hastily tilted its contents upon the struggling thing that had once been a man. The mass fell with a thud and went radiating over the cone. With the thud, the shriek ended, and a boiling confusion of smoke, dust, and flame came rushing up towards him. As it passed, he saw the cone clear again. Then he staggered back and stood trembling, clinging to the rail with both hands. His lips moved, but no words came to them. Down below was the sound of voices and running steps. The clangor of rolling in the shed ceased abruptly. You've been listening to The Cone by H.G. Wells. If you've enjoyed this story, please share it with someone. H.G. Wells once said, Affliction comes to us not to make us sad, but sober. Not to make us sorry, but wise. I've enjoyed being with you, and now I must go. Please take care. And thank you for listening to me.